In this second video on measuring stress, strain, and force with uh, load cells and strain gauges, we're going to look at some more practical devices and see how these pieces go together to make real measurements in the real world. So remember, we're putting some strain gauges onto a test specimen and uh, causing that specimen to change its length by applying a stress. And by measuring with that uh, active gauge, we can figure out how much stress we've implied, applied or how big a load it is. Now part of the problem we run into is that the resistance of individual gauges change with temperature. So if I have my active gauge here on my specimen that I'm measuring or on my load cell and I have another gauge over here that's in the same environment and on the same material at the same temperature then I can put the active gauge and a compensating gauge both into the uh, Wheatstone bridge and the result is this resistance will change because the uh, the active gauge is being stretched and the temperature is changing. This one will only change because the temperature is changing. So that between the two of them they'll stay in balance over the temperature change. If this one goes up a little bit due to temperature this one will go up a little bit due to temperature as well and the only effect that we'll see is the change on this one due to the actual stretching of the gauge. So the the uh, assembly of these Wheatstone bridges are, are critical in thinking through how you're going to compensate for making sure that you uh, don't see a change in the voltage due to something other than the, uh, the strain that you're trying to measure in the load cell. So it's common to put these mountings together at various points in the Wheatstone bridge. Sometimes you only have a single gauge and if that's the case, you really can't provide any compensation. But if we've got two gauges sensing equal and opposite strain in a bending arrangement like this, then that'll be automatically temperature compensated because we're going to see the effects due to temperature on both of them and they'll cancel out. Two gauges set up like this in uniaxial stress at locations one and four we can compensate for bending so that the bending will see an increase in this one and a decrease in that one and we won't see any effects uh, due to bending but we won't get temperature compensation. Finally if we go with the configuration that we've got uh, similar to our cantilever beam load cell with all four of the arms of the bridge being gauges on the system then we get full compensation for temperature and bending or in the application we do with a different configuration full compensation for temperature and axial stress. So you need to think through which gauges and where you're putting them in order to cancel out these temperature effects. Now when you first mounted gauges they may go through a little bit of hysteresis as the glue settles in and so you shouldn't just mount a gauge and immediately go make measurements with it. You should apply some loads for multiple cycles until things settle down. So for example, here's some situations where in the first cycle, going up and coming back down, we've done some initial plastic deformation of the glue joint. But by the time we get to the third cycle, it's just going up and down with no hysteresis. So exercise the specimens a few times or exercise the load cell a few times after you've built it before you actually try to take measurements from it. No big surprise there. Now keep in mind that our output levels are going to be very small because micro strain is going to result in microvolt output levels. So even if we get a thousand micro strain, we're still talking about millivolts. So we're trying to read the difference between a very small increase and a very small decrease in voltage to pull out just something on the order of a 1.3 millivolt difference. And to do that, we really need to have an amplifier in the circuit to translate that small voltage difference into a large absolute voltage. And also, if this voltage difference is going positive and negative, we'll need to offset that to get it into the positive only range, 0 to 5 uh, input on the microcontroller. The way we accomplish that in our labs is typically with an instrumentation amplifier like this one. 
uh, we're going to use an INA125. It provides a gain from 4 to 10,000. It provides precision offset voltages here, uh, which we can use uh, to, uh, to shift, the vo shift the output up or down so that we get our gain and our offset from this electric circuit. And we're going to use that in the labs. Now one of the problems that we'll run into in the labs is that no amplifier is perfect. And so if the uh, amplifier relationship says that we should see an increase in the voltage that keeps on going, then ideally it would go positive or negative way out beyond the power supply voltage. However, the reference voltage, the input power supply voltage, provides the maximum voltage that you could conceivably get to. And the zero volts ground, that provides the lowest voltage output that you could possibly get to. And in a real amplifier, it won't even make it out to those uh, limits either. So if you find yourself getting values out of the amplifier that aren't as high as you expected, say you were expecting something around four and a half volts and you only got four, that's probably because you don't have enough power supply. You've run into the limitations of this real amplifier. And real amplifiers also have time response characteristics. Generally, the higher the gain, the slower the amplifier. So our strain gauge response is almost instantaneous. Uh, it's a zero order response and it provides you feedback almost instantaneously. However, the amplifier has reduced gains at higher frequencies. It doesn't fail to follow those higher frequencies. It just doesn't follow them as well. So if we had a gain of 500, then if things were happening faster than about 200 times a second, we might not catch all the details. So we need to keep that in mind when we're, when we're choosing our amplifiers. And if we need higher frequencies, then we'll just have to put two amplifiers one after another in stages. So we can amplify a hundred times and then amplify a hundred times again. And that will give us a gain of 10,000 while still having a frequency response that's well over uh, a thousand hertz, which is probably going to be okay for a lot of mechanical systems. So the other thing to keep in mind is that the measured system also has its own dynamics, which are probably second order since we're measuring masses moving around subject to forces. So let's look now at some practical applications. This is a, a way scale that you can get from Lee Valley. Uh, it's got a dial on the or a, a digital indicator on the outside. And the specifications say it's accurate within 1% for weights up to 5 kilograms. So that's pretty good. Uh, what's inside this thing? What do you think? I wasn't sure, so I took one apart. And this is what I found inside. This is a load cell. This is a shear beam load cell, which is similar to our cantilever beam load cell. And it has four strain gauges hidden in there under this white stuff. And on the end, it has a note that it's a 5 kilogram load cell. So if I fasten down one end and apply a 5 kilogram load to the other end, I should see a, uh, a bridge behavior and small output voltage uh, similar to what I get with my cantilever beam load cell. Now, the red and black wires, those are the power supply to the bridge. And the green and white wires coming back, those are the measured voltage coming back from the bridge. And it's going over here to this uh, sealed area here, which contains the processor that's necessary to process all the data and some amplification and, uh, and digital data acquisition, analog to digital conversion, uh, to be able to measure the actual values. So here's an application where you would need a microcontroller to measure a practical mechanical uh, element. And if we look at the circuit board with light from behind it, we can see there's the actual chip in there that's got all of the features that it needs to manage this little way scale. Processor, analog to digital conversion, everything's in there. 
Here's a similar system. We've got a device for measuring luggage, uh, also from Lee Valley. Uh, compact, accurate, and highly functional. It says it's accurate to 1% for loads over a kilogram, and, uh, and it drops off to about 4% for small loads, which is no big surprise. And what's inside this one? Well, there's a hook at this end you hold on to, and there's where you hang your luggage or whatever you're trying to weigh. And if we open it up and look inside, this is what we see on the inside. We've got another load cell here. In this case, this is a cantilever beam load cell in the same sort of configuration that we, uh, we would have in, uh, in our measurements in the lab. We've got this force geometry here, and we can see it better over here. If I pull there and I pull there, I wind up uh, exerting a, uh, a, a bending moment on this, uh, on this element in here. Uh, to, to bend it out of shape, and I can measure that with these load cell components. Again, we've got a bridge with a positive and ground for our power supply, and uh, green and white for the differential voltage outputs from our strain gauge bridge. And I did some measurements to try to figure out what these wires were. I measured the resistances in order to figure out that the red and black were actually opposite corners of the bridge and the green and white were the other corners of the bridge. And if you put the power on the red and black you'll see the differential on the green and white. And it matches up to my tabulated resistances uh, and I wind up with a resistance for a, an individual gauge of uh, an average of almost 900 ohms. So if I connect these up, I wind up with a sensitivity of about 1 millivolt per 10 kilograms with a 3 volt power supply on it. Now, if you're going out to buy a load cell that's going to be a little more accurate, you might go to Omega and get some of these uh, fairly precise load cells, and you'll be looking at about $100 a unit. If you're looking for something you could build into a scale, you can go to eBay and for less than $2 a unit get a shear beam load cell that gives you pretty good performance here. Lots of different configurations you can build load cells into that provide different advantages and disadvantages. The main advantage of the, uh, the shear beam load cell like this one is that if you put a weight on out here, you wind up with this kind of distortion happening here, and the stretch in these ones is insensitive then to the moment that you put on it. And finally, if you've got a fairly complex application and you want to measure forces and torques in multiple dimensions, you might go with a device like this. Inside here are a whole lot of strain gauges hooked up in a geometric configuration that allows you to get, they call it six axis fork tor force torque sensor. What that means is six degrees of freedom. So we have tension this way, we have stress back and forth in that direction, we have stress back and forth into the page, and in addition we have moments about each of the axes. So we've got six degrees of freedom. We've got three forces and three moments, and we can measure all of them at the same time with this sensor to know how our robot or, or other device is loading up. It's got an onboard microcontroller to keep the analog signals shielded for noise protection, to do some validation and self-testing, and it provides all of the output digitally so that you can hook it directly to a microcontroller or to a computer. And you can find out more about this, uh, this system over here. So in the lab, we're going to go with a much simpler system, something more along this line. And we're going to figure out how these bridge circuits work and how we can use that to make an estimate of a single force. But keep in mind, it all leads up to sensors like this that are much more complex and that you would normally buy as packaged units rather than trying to build your own.